So please continue to enjoy your breakfast as we uh, proceed forward with our program. And I'd like to start off by recognizing our legislators and elected officials who are here with us today. Uh, of course, uh, we, we've uh, recognized, but I'd like to recognize again, Texas Supreme Court Justice Jimmy Blacklock. We also have the Chief Justice of the 12th Court of Appeals and Tyler Jim Worthen. Welcome back, Judge. From the legislative branch, State Representatives Terry Leo Wilson and Richard Hayes, good morning. And from the, uh, the other side of the Capitol, Senators Bob Hall and Kevin Sparks, again, welcome. And also, I'm glad to welcome and to recognize from uh, the State Board of Education, uh, Chair Aaron Kinsey and uh, Member LJ Francis. Welcome, thanks for joining us. So today's breakfast is uh, sponsored is the Sumner's Foundation. We're proud to have their continued support. Uh, thank you to, to them and all of our Texas Policy Summit sponsors who are here with us today for helping to make this year the absolute best Texas Policy Summit so far. And we're proud to have many of the Sumner scholars from across the state here with us today to learn more about public policy and how all good policy originates in the states and not from Washington, D.C. Uh, please watch this brief video to learn more about the Sumner's Foundation. We come from different walks of life and follow different paths, pursue different professions, practice different traditions. We are different. Yet one thing unites us. We are Americans. We are the Sumner's Foundation. Developing a network of thought leaders around the founding ideals of self-governance by funding scholarships and investing in programs that educate and engage Americans. The Sumner's Foundation, on the job since 1949. So I'd like to invite our two keynote panelists to join me on stage as I introduce them to you. Uh, first of all, it's such a privilege and, and treat for us to, to welcome and to recognize uh, the Honorable Jason Chaffetz, uh, who was the former chairman of the House Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Jason was elected to the United States Congress in 2008 in the 3rd District of Utah and served until 2017. As chairman of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee, he oversaw the second largest committee in the House and spearheaded some of the nation's highest profile government investigations. Uh, he joined uh, the, the faculty at Harvard University in 2017, and uh, as many of you know, uh, is a uh, Fox News Channel uh, contributor, appearing regularly on Fox News and Fox Business. He's also a former place kicker on the Brigham Young University football team, setting five new school records while earning his BA in communications uh, and then being in the local business community for 16 years. Please help me welcome former United States Congressman Jason Chaffetz. So y'all have a seat. Um, I'm also privileged to uh, introduce our other panelist. Uh, the other panelist is my friend and colleague, Brett Tolman. Brett Tolman was never a record-setting college athlete. But he is an exceptional man, and he's the executive director for our Right on Crime initiative. Uh, Brett was a leading figure in the drafting and passage of the First Step Act, one of the most sweeping reforms of the federal criminal justice system in decades. Brett continues to advise many members of Congress on such issues. He's an attorney and founder of the Tolman Group, focusing on public policy and government reform. Prior to entering private practice, uh, Brett was appointed by President George Bush in 2006 as the United States Attorney for the District of Utah 
and held that office for nearly four years from 2006 to 2009. Uh, please help me welcome our panelists. So gentlemen, good morning. Uh, we're here to morning. talk about uh, abuse of power, the weaponization of the FBI and the federal government against Americans. And I was hoping, Jason, with your background as chairman of oversight, you could kind of frame the discussion for us today on, you know, we can't look forward until we know where we've come from. So, you know, how would you set the table for what we're going to talk about this morning. Well, thank you. Uh, good to be back with you. I was here a few years ago. Uh, Kevin Roberts uh, was your director. I'm working with him now at the Heritage Foundation, but thanks so much for having me. I do want to clarify, I was not an athlete. <laughs> I, was a, I was a place kicker, you know? <laughs> if they touch me, they throw a flag. I thought, you know, right? That, that's, that, that's the position that works for me. This is uh, pre-Steve uh, Sarkeesian, uh, days, but I was there when Ty Detmer, a Texan, came and won the Heisman Trophy, and so I had five school records. That's because we scored a lot of touchdowns. They were all extra point records. That's a, that's a testament to Ty Detmer and the offense, not so much the place kicker, but I'll take it, you know. And I'd like to remind you, Tons, we never lost a game by the margin of my missed kicks. Otherwise, I'd be living in Texas or Arizona or somewhere else, you know. Um, it, it was an honor and a privilege to serve in the United States Congress, but I, I need to give you just, bear with me here just a little bit. This, this all comes together in a crescendo. Uh, the Oversight Committee in Congress was founded in 1814. The whole idea and the premise was that every government expenditure that goes out the door, Congress should be looking at. It uh, had many different names and titles. It, it got big, it got small. For, for a big part of that time, it was the biggest uh, committee in all of Congress. Fast forward a little bit to the mid-1800s. There was a young uh, gentleman who was elected from the great state of Illinois. And he joined, um, and the, the committee that he was assigned to, under a different name but the same committee, was the Oversight Committee, and his name was Abraham Lincoln. Now, Abraham Lincoln was not known as Abraham so much in the Congress. His name was Spotty. See, the Mexican-American War was being touted by, I believe it was President Polk. And Abraham Lincoln was really disputing where was the spot in which those shots were fired. Show me exactly, Mr. President, where were those shots fired? And so they kept calling him Spotty. He gave his first speech on the floor of the House about eight days into his being a, a member of Congress. And then as the President would go around the country, communication was a bit different, Abraham Lincoln would follow him from city to city and give a speech and challenge the president and basically perform, performing oversight on the executive branch. <laughs> and I love that. I love that. Now fast forward, and you need to also understand this. Back in the day, there was a very famous case. People say, hey, Congress, why don't you stand up for yourself? Why don't you incarcerate somebody? There used to be a jail. It's not quite like that, OK? There was a famous case involved some people you know. Sam Houston was in Washington, D.C. and accosted another member, a, a member of Congress. That's the allegation. And, and uh, so they held him in contempt of Congress for getting essentially into this fight with a member of Congress. His attorney was Francis Scott Key. Now, he was convicted, and while they were going through this, they didn't know where to put him, so there was like a saloon in Washington, D.C., and they put him on the top floor. He was incarcerated for months. But Congress showed a little bit of backbone, saying, hey, you're not going to come after us, and we're actually going to, you know, take care of it. And that background and, and experience was very, um, it, it created a wave. Now fast forward to the uh, 1980s when Ronald Reagan is president. His secretary of, of uh, education was Neil Gorsuch's mother. She was the secretary of education. Congress wanted documents from the Department of Education. And she basically thumbed her nose at him and said, come and get them. I'm not giving them up. I am not giving them up. And you know what? Congress just folded. 
Congress said, we're going to have to let the executive branch go and do this. And the Reagan administration said, sorry, you're not getting them. Unfortunately, for a guy like me, that was a really bad day. Because until Congress actually stands up for itself, uses the power of the purse, uses its, uh, you know, we always say, oh, you get the power of the purse. We never, ever use it, okay, ever. I've never seen it happen. Maybe we need more fistfights. Yeah. <laughs> so right now, as a foundation, we're going to talk about the problems and challenges. One of them is, I don't believe, personally, there should even be an appropriations committee. Because you have 22 authorizing committees. Take anything you want, including the Department of Justice, OK? You can, you, I was on the Judiciary Subcommittee. Uh, uh, you can take any one of those cabinet level positions, and they will be authorizing committees in Congress. The problem is, the Appropriations Committee will appropriate money to programs that have never been authorized. And there's a total disconnect. Until, we, we're going to talk about all these problems. Until Congress gets a backbone and actually says, we're not going to fund you, because if you don't starve the beast, if you don't deprive them of the number one thing they need, which is money, then guess what? We're going to have this problem. So they're going to pass a... How many trillions of dollars? Was it today or something? I mean, and there'll be no changes. And until we actually understand that the Congress has to stand up for itself, use the power of the purse, hold these people accountable. The Appropriations Committee is a new phenomenon. It didn't used to be that way. It would be so refreshing if the Department of Justice wanted its money that they had to go to Jim Jordan and the Judiciary Committee to get that money. Do you think things would change? Oh, no. They have to go to the appropriators. They just need to go over and talk. Do you, who, who chairs? Who's the, who's the cardinal in charge of the Department of Justice on the Appropriations Committee? There's not a single person that can name that. I can't even tell you who it is. That person holds all the strings. They're the ones that are funding this mess. Well, what I'll add, though, Jason, what's odd <clears throat> is Right now, because we have allowed, well, Congress doesn't have the background, so they're not holding accountable the Department of Justice and the FBI, et cetera, and they don't use the power of the purse to do it. So now what you have is this, this ironic situation where you have real crimes like the Hunter Biden and Biden crime family that should be investigated by DOJ, but, but they've shifted their power to politics. And ironically, you know, the, the only way we know about their crimes is because Jim Jordan and Comer are holding hearings. Now, we don't know if anything will happen, but that's, that's right now that last vestige of power that they have. And without them, we would not have exposed anything that happened in the Biden, you know, crime, crime family. Both of y'all are spot on, but Brett, let me stay with you for a second because you know, it just, it's, it's rougher in Washington, D.C. right now. And, and several of our guests seeing this panel topic for this morning pulled me aside this week and, and it brought up, you know, the, the hypocrisy, the contrast mm -hmm. between the fact that, that Peter Navarro right now is in federal yep. prison this week for contempt of Congress. Eric Holder was held in contempt of Congress. Uh, nothing happened. Not a day in jail, never prosecuted there. What do we do with that? What do, how, do, how should we see that in what's happening? Yeah, I mean, let's, let's take January 6ers, and I'll give you some, <clears throat> some information that's not, not public, but I'm authorized to tell you. So the US attorney at the time of January 6, his name is Michael Sherwin, very good friend of mine. <clears throat> he was in charge, and he was asked by Merrick Garland and the DOJ, well, Barr and then Merrick Garland, put together a plan, a prosecution plan, investigation and prosecution plan. And he identified, Rob, a standard that he would use. It was called entry into the Capitol plus. And that plus had to be something like you hurt someone, you broke something in the Capitol, you stole something, 
something in addition to just walking into the Capitol. And he identified between 200 and 300 people. He went and presented that. Barr accept that. When Merrick Garlic came in, they got rid of Mike Sherwin, ran him out, and said, the political opportunity is so significant, we're going to prosecute thousands, everybody that was there. They were willing to circumvent our Fourth and Fifth and Sixth Amendments in their investigations and use extraordinary national security authority to investigate citizens of the United States, many whom, and I represented some, many whom that went into the Capitol did not know. I think about my client, a 65-year-old concert pianist. She was there supporting Trump at, a, at, a, at, a, at the rally, went into the Capitol following her son-in-law, thought it was like the Utah Capitol, and, and Jason can tell you this, you can go anytime and walk in and there's no security and you can walk into the Capitol and walk out. And she thought that's what was going on. And she was in for 20 minutes and she served months in federal prison. And so that was all part of, and I've talked to FBI agents that are not happy because they, they were pulled off of priorities and violent crime and human trafficking crime and they were told this is the highest priority in the nation. And when people got upset and they wanted to criticize and, and they said, Washington DC's US attorney is using all their resources. And by the way, you know what they tried to do? They tried to investigate and prosecute Mike Sherwin before he left office. <laughs> the US attorney who had fairness and consistency and, and justice on his mind and didn't care about anything but the facts and the law. And, and so you have a situation where one side of the, the, the political world and landscape we live in is now willing to say, we'll disregard the law and the facts. It's more important that we get to the end we want. We won't care about you know, how we get there. And we'll sacrifice, we'll sacrifice our, our, our law and order system. I never thought, and I spent 25 plus years now in the criminal justice system, I never thought when I was a federal prosecutor that we would abdicate the notion of fairness. I was just as happy to prosecute a Republican as I was a Democrat when I was U.S. Attorney if the facts and the law supported it, but we're not, we're not there right now, Rob. So Jason, staying on that point a little bit different, and I, I get frustrated in policy debates in the what about ism. You know, you talk to somebody and you bring up a point like, well, what about your guy? And you know, look, they're both wrong, they're both wrong. But there's a point here. You know, if you contrast the, the prosecution of the, the pro-life protesters at the Planned Parenthood centers with yep. the, the people outside the, the Supreme Court justices' homes or you know, you compare the, the January 6 defendants with what we saw in our, our streets from Antifa and, and BLM. I think there's a credible case to say that there's two different systems of justice and it really seems to favor one side versus the other. Yeah, I mean, that's the, the fundamental part of it. I think, I think America is starting to understand that there is a two-tier system of justice that depending on your name, your political affiliation, one of the things the Department of Justice did, if you look back in the early days of Biden, they, they very quickly uh, designated that uh, white supremacy was the number one threat against the United States of America. And so if you believe that white supremacy is the number one issue, then there's gonna be a dragnet out there saying, let's go find white people and let's make sure that we use all the resources. And then it becomes the justification to do all kinds of surveillance and other types of uh, surreptitious activities, that, that's pretty well documented along the way. I think, you know, as uh, conservatives, Republicans, and some good-minded Democrats as well, you, you have to keep making the case that, hey, we're here about fairness, about justice, and, and let's just bring up the, the whole Hunter, let me come back to the Hunter Biden thing. You have Peter Navarro who's been in jail, what, a week now, something like a week? Um, and Hunter Biden issued a subpoena and doesn't show. Then they have another hearing, and I do think the committee made a mistake. I'm a huge James Comer fan, an oversight committee fan. 
But they didn't issue him a second subpoena. They should have issued him a second subpoena. So he doesn't show and says, well, you know, I appreciate it, but it just doesn't work with my schedule. Even though my <laughs> schedule's changed and I don't have a conflict. Too busy. I, I'm uh, you know, but thanks for, the, thanks for the ask. Uh, artists have tough schedules. Yeah, and <laughs> nothing, yeah, artists have tough So he doesn't show. Nothing's going to happen to him. Nothing's going to happen to him. Um, Devin Archer, they, they could have issued a subpoena on him. Didn't do it. When I was in Congress and I was going after, uh, you know, I was very involved in the Hillary Clinton investigation, we had a guy who we were pursuing named Brian Pagliano. Mm -hmm. Brian Pagliano was the um, IT specialist for Hillary Clinton. Worked with her for four years at the State Department. When she left, he left, went to work on the campaign. He was the one that was allegedly involved to some degree with the bleach bit and the destroying all the documents and whatnot. We had issued subpoenas. Now, in the world I come from, if you're issued a subpoena and you purposely destroy those documents, there should be some sort of consequence. Nothing. Then we find out, I, if you remember the hearing that I conducted with James uh, Comey, and at one point I said to Comey, just fishing. I didn't know if it was true or not. I said, did you ever issue, did you ever have an immunity agreements out there? And he said, oh, we might have. I don't really know. I'll have to get back to you, Congressman. I'm like, really? All right. So they come up, the Department of Justice comes up, and they produce three uh, documents. And they show us three. Now, the person there from the FBI, she was so nervous. This is me, John Radcliffe, another great Texan. Uh, and Trey Gowdy, along with some Democrats. They produced these documents to us, and immediately John Ratcliffe and Trey Gowdy, some seasoned attorneys, came to us and said, well, wait a sec, there's no requirement in this immunity agreement to cooperate with the government. This is just a get out of jail free card. You don't, you're not gonna be prosecuted. There's never, never issued, those are never issued. And, and these, Ratcliffe and, and Gowdy are like, this is unbelievable. And then I finally turned to her and I said, are there any more? And she said, yeah, there are. So they coughed those two up. One of them was this Brian Pagliano. His deal was, and I asked for all the documents that he had, he was the IT specialist at the State Department on the seventh floor, and then they finally came back and said he never sent, nor did he ever receive an email. <laughs> like, what, how is that possible? So I said, all right, I'm going to have him appear before the committee. First time, no show. Issued another one, served by the U.S. Marshals, a no show. We refer that criminally to the Department of Justice, nothing, nothing. And again, if you don't go, my, I have the same answer to everything. If you don't hold them accountable with appropriations, nothing's going to change because the national media is not going to help you. They're not going to write these stories. Yeah, let, let me add, if I can, Rob, <clears throat> there's a motion that's been filed in the classified documents case right now. It's called a, a motion for selective prosecution. In 25 plus years, I've seen that motion filed one other time, one other time. That motion was also just granted in a case in Washington by a federal judge. That motion says you're picking and choosing who you want to prosecute, not based on facts and law and consistency, but you're, you're picking who you want. The judge right now in Florida is correctly considering that. I hope she grants it. Because can you think of anything more telling and, and visual than the contrast of Joe Biden and classified documents, not the president, possessed over years and years, and, and, and possessed while he was a senator, and, and by the way, the documents he had that were classified when he was a senator that somehow made it into his home and into his, his, his office, you have to do a lot to get it out of Congress. You have to take that from a secured area that's, you go to the crypt, you ride an elevator, you go through security. So to say that you inadvertently took it is an impossibility. And then you compare that to the classified documents, the Mar-a-Lago one, of a former president bringing his files. You prosecute one, you don't prosecute the other. The Hillary Clinton, 
prosecution. It might be the greatest, mo most egregious example of selective prosecution that is out there today. Dig into those, look at those cases, you'll be shocked at what you see, the similarities, and, 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 and in fact, it's, it's worse in the, in the Biden situation. Let me, let me ask, so Brett and Jason, it's not just that it's selective prosecution. It, it seems to me that our current government is breaking the rules to get people. And not just political figures, but you know, if you could ex talk about a little bit, you know, the, the the 100 J6 defendants were just have to be resentenced because the the sentencing enhancement that the government used was invalid. And you know, you look at like the Douglas Mackey instance, like that had to get approved, that had to get through the the chain of command to to prosecute and try to put in federal prison a guy that posted a, a, a election meme. Uh, on online uh, and, and to try to put him there, um, you know, the, the novel ways that these statutes are being used against the pro-life protesters, uh, it's not just, you know, it's not just playing rough, but, but there's some real cheating going on. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll just say, it. Let's, let's take a look at Georgia right now. Georgia takes a statute, the RICO statute, the federal RICO statute, is a, is a, it's a very powerful statute. We used it to go after the cartel, we used it to go after mobs, and the last case that I authorized is U.S. Hey, Rico, I heard this in Congress. It's, it's not a crime, it's not I know. A crime. <laughs> it's not against the law. <laughs> go ahead, bro. There, there are legal experts that, that do disagree that it's a crime. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> so, we went after a, 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 a large gang that was operating as an organization. On the federal side, you have to show there's an underlying criminal activity that an organization is engaged in and they are working together to achieve that, that, that goal. In Georgia, they passed a similar statute, but they left out an important part, that there has to be an underlying criminal activity. <laughs> so then they go after Trump and his lawyers. Now, I don't care if you like Trump or you dislike Trump, this should not be happening in our country where we're willing to do exactly what Rob said, and that is, I know it doesn't apply, but I'm willing to do it because, and here are the reasons, politically, I get a lot of, a lot of credit on my side. The media is not going to do their job and criticize or investigate. I don't have anyone else to hold me, author hold me accountable, and with prosecutors, you cannot right now currently hold them accountable for abuse of their discretion. You can't prosecute them because we've expanded immunity. You can't go after them for ethics violations <clears throat> unless you can prove they did something criminal. So we're, we're at a place now where we've given so much power to prosecutors with no accountability and no transparency that we are seeing the result of when government is given power and given money and we don't require them to justify how they use their power or their money. Okay, so real quickly, because this is gonna go right back in Brett's lab. One of the best things I did on the Judiciary Committee as I look back and say, oh yeah, I was there for a while. I was not an attorney, um, uh, but I was on Judiciary that I was a holdout on FISA reauthorization. 100%. And I said, no, I'm not going to vote for that. <laughs> but the one thing I did convince him to do, which is paying off now, is we, I said, look, it's got to have a sunset. Don't let it go in perpetuity. Have a seven-year sunset. So that sunset is coming up. Now we're revisiting it, which I think is a good thing. It's the best amendment I offer. I think I may have offered in judiciary <laughs> for the seven years. But Brett understands this more intimately than you can imagine. Well, so they're they're reauthorizing it, and right now, I was sitting and I get this email, and it's an email of conservative former U.S. attorneys, and there are hundreds of them, and it says, "Join us on this letter." So these are all individuals appointed by Reagan, Bush, Trump. Join us on this letter and demand that Congress reauthorize 702, you know, sneak and peek, the, you know, you know wiretapping without, without subpoenas. 
authorize, reauthorize that. Don't let them require that they have to have a subpoena and they have to have a judge authorize these certain ones. And I couldn't believe it. Everybody was signing on to it. Everyone's agreeing to it. And I said, did you not just see that they uncovered abuse of the FISA laws, even to the tune of someone sending a false email, right, and, expo and sending that to the FISA court to secure search warrants that they shouldn't have. And I said, I will not sign on to this. And I didn't hear one single former US attorney say, you know, you're right about that. And so it's so steeped in Washington, DC, and they give power so frequently. That sunset provision is, is it's enormous right now. Because now you have individuals in the Senate and in, in, in the House. You have Senator Mike Lee. You have um, Rand Paul. You have others that are saying, we're no longer going to go forward and go along with this. If you want to surveil United States citizens, you're going to have to follow the Constitution. I just want to add, wanna, real quick, one other anecdote to that. I'm on judiciary. I have a security clearance. And I said, I want to go to one of these FISA courts. And they said, well, we, you can't do that. I said, well, you wanted me to reauthorize a court that I've never been to. And by the way, there are a number of secret courts out there. Did you know that there's, an, uh, there's uh, um, a vaccine court? Every year, Congress appropriates billions of dollars for vaccinations. And you can apply to this court in certain categories for payment for vaccine injuries. But it's secret. And I said, well, I want to go to that. And he said, oh, you, you, Congressman, you can't go to that. What, I have a security clearance. I'm on the authorizing committee. What do you mean I can't go to it? Oh, no, it's too private. And I, I, when I wanted to go to the FISA court, and they said, well, it's not actually a court. It's like we send these documents to a judge. They sit in a secure room. They read these documents. They authorize it. So how often do they get authorized? What is it, 99% of the time they get authorized? And it's not a court the way I think we're supposed to have that. There's got to be some sort of pushback a little bit in order to make the case on the other side to be an actual court. That's who the United States should be. And Jason, same with you. And one of the reasons we wanted to have this panel this morning, though, is that we're not just talking about Trump administration officials. We're not just talking about Washington, D.C. And you had a great tweet uh, in January in talking about the federal mandate, I guess, to banks to search oh, yeah. private transactional records for key terms like Trump and, and, and MAGA, and maybe some of y'all's bank's records were, were searched as part of this. What, what was that about, and what do you see that's broader than just what's happening in the Beltway? I, I think it's one of the biggest issues of our time. I've written four books, very fortunate to do that. Puppeteers is the current one that I have. But I did get a contract to write another book. This is, good. this is the core of what this next book that's coming out probably a year from now, uh, about how the government, big tech, big business, spy on you and your family. And most of the people you talk to, they say, ah, I don't care. I haven't done anything wrong. That's not where this is going, folks. They are spying you, on you for a lot of different information. They're taking your, your information as a suspicionless American. And if you, in this case, have gone to Cabela's, heaven forbid, to buy some worms to go bass fishing or whatever, you know, then you're going to be on this list. And they're going to start to profile you. They're going to combine that with AI. And they're going to start assigning you a score. And this is what they've done in China. This is, it's a social score. How environmentally friendly are you? How, how good are you in terms of voting? And where do you vote? Um, what's your health care profile? I mean, they can take every bit of data about you and then be able to make decisions about what sort of benefits you get, don't get, where you can travel to, where you can't travel to. This is where this is going. And it's a slow drip where the younger generation just kind of accepts it. And I think that is the plan. And that, that's what's very scary about this. S looking into your banking records, looking into your financial transactions is nobody's business. And shame on those big financial institutions that are coughing up this information without getting uh, a subpoena or a court order to do so. And even the banks are doing this in a one-handed way. 
They're giving it, giving it right over to the Democrats without any paperwork, so to speak. And with the Republicans, when they ask, oh no, we're not doing that. And it's fundamentally totally wrong as an American. It's, and it's just so backwards, but it, it really is more scary than you think it is because of what the end game ends up looking like. Let me like. give a real life ex example of this. <clears throat> so uh, I, I get contacted by an individual who said, I just had the not FBI knock on my door. And I said, okay, and he's, he's a businessman, he's a conservative. And he goes, I have no idea how they got to my front door. And I said, well, what, what's the issue? He says, I was in Washington, D.C. on January 6th. And I said, you were in Washington, D.C. on January 6th? And he goes, you, you went in the Capitol then? He's like, no, I didn't. I wasn't there for that. So they're knocking on his door. I started digging into it, and I realize that what they've done is they've designated in a national security emergency, January 6th, and they got from all sources, airlines, banks, um, you name it. He goes, I didn't post anything. I had no pictures. I wasn't there. They knocked on my door, and they want to interrogate me. And come to find out, they used all that information to, to geolocate everybody that was in Washington, D.C. that was not a resident there. So let, let me get, that, I'll give one more yeah, example. We did hearings. Violations on, of, of constitutional protections, for sure. We, we, did this, we did this investigation, actually did hearings on it. The IRS had purchased what's called a stingray. Now, a stingray they, they, uh, is about $450,000. And you can put it up on an airplane or a helicopter and you can zoom around and you can pick up everybody's uh, telephone. You can pick them up, all, all of them. And the IRS- Tin foil hats. <laughs> yeah. So we bring the IRS in and say, well, what, what'd you need this for? Oh, it's for law enforcement. Okay, but you're not law enforcement, you're the IRS, okay? So, well, sometimes we have to serve, you know, we gotta go in and do that. I said, no, you go talk to the local sheriff if you think you're gonna have problems when you're knocking on somebody's door. Yeah. You don't need to do this. And by the way, the number of guns that are issued to federal employees is absolutely stunning. I'm all pro Second Amendment guns, but not for, not for you know, these fake cops out here that are throwing their badges around. Well, 87,000 new ones. Yeah, so the, they had purchased these stingrays. They said, well, we don't ever plan to use it, but in case we plan to use it. And I said, then why did you buy two of them? <laughs> they bought one for the East Coast, they bought one for the West Coast. So they spent almost a million dollars. Then they're complaining they don't have enough money to process your returns and answer to the customer service. Meanwhile, they have to have airplanes and surveillance tools to go in and be an airplane. Now, they're not just gathering your telephone number, then they're looking at who are you communicating with? Mm -hmm. who are you, who's on the other side of that line? And they're trying to put together this labyrinth. This is so pervasive. What I think people will be shocked about in the book that I'm, I'm writing about is how much the government spends to acquire this data and how much the government makes by selling the data. So sitting in the middle of this are data brokers. And you know where this ends up in? The hands of the Chinese and the Russians and others. And so when we talk about TikTok and all those other things, it gets real serious really fast, people. And the government is sitting right in the middle of this equation as a willing partner, and it's scary. I was in the room when Jim Comey, during the, the reauthorization and expansion of the FISA power of the Patriot Act, stated to members of Congress, we will never use this against American citizens. We'll never use this power. It's unauthorized to use against American citizens without some exceptional and extraordinary exceptions and a judge looking at it. We now know millions of Americans have been surveilled using FISA that was authorized in the Patriot Act. Is it a lie? Did he know at the time? Is it a, you know, a, a plausible deniability situation? It doesn't matter what happens when Washington DC is in charge of its own power and wh whether or not they're gonna be held accountable, government expands. 
they expand their power. That's why TPPF exists, because it is to remind the American citizens <clears throat> that we were founded on the notion of limiting power. How frightening is it to see a Supreme Court justice saying, I'm a little concerned <clears throat> that the First Amendment might be a constriction on government. Yeah. <laughs> that is what it's for. <laughs> so there's, you know, what I'm hearing, and in no hyperbole, is that there's probably a Robert Henneke computer file sitting in Washington, D.C. right now with my personal information or things that are there, probably everyone's name that's here. And Jason, Brett, in the few minutes we have and kind of looking at where do we go from here, I agree with everything you said, Jason, about the role of Congress and the abdication of that role and really what needs to happen, but it's not. And so it's kind of where else do we go from here? And to start in framing this, going back to Hillary Clinton, you know, when, when Trump came in, he said, I'm not going to prosecute her. Do we need to have mutual assured destruction to get back to a level of, of, of neutrality on this? Uh, if you look at, you know, do we need to have state attorney generals start doing the same thing that, fan, you know, that uh, Letitia James in New York is doing, you know, but to the other side or local prosecutors? Um, is, is that where we get back to a truce, is, is to return fire? Um, you know, what, do you, what do you all think? I, I, I don't want us to be, I, I want to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. I, if it's a true principle, it should work on both sides of the aisle, no matter where the political winds are, are swaying that day. Um, truth and justice, they, th this is not a debatable issue. It shouldn't be so partisan one side or the other. You've heard how I feel about the appropriation side and changing that. I believe that sunlight is the best disinfectant. If, it, if it's the United States of America, it should be open and transparent. You should be able to look at it. And if there's nothing to hide there, then just show us what you're doing. That's, that's who we are as the American people, okay? But solving this problem, there have to be some fundamental structural changes. And I do believe states play a big role in that. I think governors, uh, attorneys general, uh, state treasurers, you look at what Marla Oaks has done in Utah in exposing DEI um, and what BlackRock's doing. I know Texas made a big move pulling out $8 billion and, you know, those types of things make a big difference. Well, <clears throat> I'll say this. My father grew up, he was, he was a brawler. He grew up in, in, outside of L.A. and he always said, if you get, if a kid comes up, you avoid a fight. As, as, as much as you can avoid a fight. If you get punched, you hit back immediately and you hit hard. If you get punched in the kidney, you hit him twice. You hit him in the face. It doesn't have to be a cheap shot, but Rob, I want state prosecutors, I want attorneys general, I want them to hit back hard. I want you to, and you do not have to play unfair. That's the beauty of the Democrats. They do violate the law, and it's obvious. We don't have to give them a pass anymore. Take, you know, Ken Paxton. Take, take the attorneys general across this country. Exercise the sovereignty of these states and hit back hard. When I say hit back, there are individuals that need to be prosecuted, whether it's election fraud, whether it's theft of government resources, whether it's on the larger scale and it's bleach bit and destroying evidence. Hit back hard because that is the that is the only way I think bullies that are willing willing to violate the law are going to say maybe we should rethink doing this again. Amen. Strong, strong, yeah. <laughs> strong closing, Jason, Brett. Thank you for the discussion here today. We, we, we're out of time, uh, but uh, if you all would help me thank Jason Chaffetz, Brett Tolman for being here today. Thank you. Thanks. 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 Thanks.